Remember Darby Allen got caught underneath the garage door and in a figure four leg lock at the hands of Jay Lethal here not long ago. So the opening match on Dynamite was Jay Lethal versus Darby Allen in a grudge match. And again, I'm not going to talk as much about the matches on this program as why they're happening, or in some cases, asking why they're happening, or how little sense they make. I would have loved this match. First of all, I'd love the match if they'd used the ring, because they didn't much. Darby loves to get flung around like a fucking satchel on the floor. But can you imagine? Jade Lethal is so good. Imagine how good this might have been, not only as potentially as a match, but as a as a draw, as a ratings draw, or as something of interest to the fans, if Jay had been presented as a person on the level of Darby Allen, on the level of any of the stars from the start. It's the same thing that Tony has done with everybody, ex-Ring of Honor talent or not. Everybody comes in, except the obvious, you know, punk or whatever, Everybody comes in and gets beat. Not only once, but multiple times on television. And I'll try to explain this again. I don't care if everybody knows, in quotation marks, who so-and-so is and what they've done and their whole life story. When a new talent comes into a new promotion, comes into a new television program, who they work with in their first match and whether it's competitive or not and whether they win or lose or not tells the fans what level to take them at. And when it's not just once, but it's several times, that confirms the mental picture that the fan has. Okay, this guy's a middle card guy. He's an underneath guy. He's somebody, he's a star, he, whatever he is. And you don't just bring people in with no plan and have them have good matches with people on television and get beat. And then suddenly, after two months or three months or six months, then you start giving them wins. Horses out of the barn, cowboy. So, this match, you know, a, a Jade Lethal is a tremendous talent. Darby Allen, as we've said, has his own weird charisma. They spent a lot of time out on the floor because Darby likes it that way. And they went to break five minutes into the show with neither guy in the ring and nothing happening. Darby's down selling and Jay's wandering around. So for the lead-in audience that they got, they see Darby Allen. He's been presented as a star. Yes, he has interest. Then they see Jay Lethal. Great wrestler that they've never really been told is a great wrestler because their first impressions of him were, he gets beat, and then they go to break five minutes in without being in a gripping contest. So I'm interested to see how many people stuck around. But coming back, on the other side of the break, they were in the ring. The best spot of the match, Darby Allen does a suicide dive out of the ring on Zippy, the giant pinhead, and he just bounced right off him. The guy didn't even move. That looked incredible. That was a tremendous visual. And that's the kind of thing that if you are going to do it and know you can do it, do it in an angle. <laughs> but anyway, as soon as that happened and the referee's kicking Zippy and Sanjay out of ringside, a guy dressed as Sting in a Sting mask and black, you know, blah, 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 attacks Darby Allen from behind on the floor, throws him in the ring, and Jay Lethal hits the lethal injection, one, two, three. And by the way, that move, I know it's Gaga, but the one there's there's always a Gaga move that somebody does so well you can buy it and you don't mind it. And with that move, Jay's so smooth with it, and if a guy takes it smooth, I know it's Gaga, the guy doesn't have to stand there, but it does look good. So I'm not going to browbeat him for that. But if Jay Lethal had beat Darby Allen, even in this convoluted finish, 
in his first TV appearance, Darby Allen would be the same and Jay Lethal would be a lot better off. But here we get to the good part. Because you can tell that Tony is now is going into hyperactive mode trying to be the booker of the year. Because he's making this shit so complicated, you couldn't figure it out with a compass and a Rosetta Stone. <laughs> because everybody knows that the best booking is always so fucking complicated, you need a protractor and a notepad to figure it out. So, they unveil... <laughs> they unveil Sting and make a big show and I know where they were going with this and I'll explain it in a second but still my god they unveil Sting and make a big build up to it and he takes the mask off and the people are kind of rumbling like who's it going to be who's it going to be and they take the mask off and the people fall dead silent and the announcers scream, what? It's, it's Cole Carter. And the people are standing there going, who the fuck is that? I mean, they, the announcers could have said, it's, it's Dan Tucker. It was the most audience silence I've ever heard from a reveal ever, uh, ever. Yeah. Get out of the way for old Dan Tucker. He's too late to have his supper. Supper's over and dinner's cooking. Old Dan Tucker just stands there looking. Old Dan Tucker rode to town riding a mule and leading a hound. Hound dog barked and mule did buck. Old Dan Tucker had real bad luck. Get out of the way for old Dan Tucker. He's a real motherfucker. If you anyway, wanted to sing, you just had to say you wanted to sing today. Um... So, so they're standing there as Dan Tucker. <laughs> Cole Carter. Cole Carter. And suddenly music plays and it's Sting. And there's the lights and the snow. And the heels jump out in the owl wave where, of course, if somebody's coming to attack you and you're in the ring, it's better. You'll get a better vantage point if you jump down in the aisle so you can't catch them coming through the ropes. They got a fair shot. So they're waiting in the aisleway for the for the appearance of Sting, and Darby Allen stands up in the ring, and in the back of Darby Allen from behind, into the ring comes Jeff Jarrett. And I'll tell you one thing, apparently us Tennessee boys are the only ones that can do a surprise debut. Because think about this. Every surprise debut that you can think of in the last 15 years has been stooged off or rumored or hinted at or widely known except mine and Jeff Jarrett's. When we show up, we keep it a secret. And a lot of people out there now are saying, I wish the promotion would too, but nevertheless. So Jeff comes in and Darby won't turn around and Jeff's winding up and and Darby apparently is going to just stand there forever. So Jeff reaches, grabs him and spins him and hits him over the head with the guitar, which apparently busted him open hard way. Cause as he's laying there, a pool of blood starts appearing around his head. And Jeff cut a promo about his family legacy and how long they've been in wrestling and that they always make an impact and that body bags are on the way. And he even he knocked some of the production people because they all used to work for him and probably at this point will again. And here's the thing. An hour later, I guess right after the show was by the time the show went off the air, Tony Khan had tweeted welcoming Jeff Jarrett to the company and announcing that he was also going to have a position as an executive in the office. Okay. Either one of these things I will work with. Everybody knows I think Jeff Jarrett's a fucking fantastic wrestling mind and talent. He's uh, Right now, if he walked in there, he'd be one of the upper 10 percentile of best workers on the TNA roster. At his age, he's still in great shape, but because yeah. of his... You just said, you just hit the problem right there. You don't even realize it. 
Well, yeah, well, and that's part of the problem. You said TNA. Or, oh, did I say TNA? I'm that's sorry. That's the problem. It conjures some thoughts of TNA. That's the All exact right. problem. But here we go. We're going to break this down. He would be one of the upper 10 percentile of the wrestlers in the AEW roster because he was one of the upper 10 percentile of wrestlers in the TNA roster. He's had 30 years of 30 plus years of experience, started as a teenager. He grew up in the business. He's worked with everybody. He can work with everybody. His fuck, he can wrestle, he can fight, he can do the Tennessee stuff, he can fucking work. And that's uh, uh, indeed the problem is that he would come in and he knows how to be a heel and a babyface. And he would come in and be able to have a match with anybody on this roster. But that's not where right now Jeff Jarrett to me is needed. And we'll talk about that in a second. But for the point is for Tony to do a surprise debut of a heel that comes in, <laughs> breaks a guitar over one of the baby faces head, busts him open, announces he's going to fuck with everybody there. Cause they're all a bunch of fucking kids basically. And body bags are on the way. And the owner of the company an hour later says, welcome, Jeff. You're going to be an executive. These two things cannot coexist, can they? How the, what the fuck was, why? Unless Tony's turned heel. I, I, that's what, I, he's, he's turned to crack, apparently. The other stuff wasn't strong enough. So, and here's another thing. As much as I like Jeff Jarrett's work, and even though he's in good shape at his age, better shape than most people are at any age. Goddamn, they don't need him in the ring at this point. They need him in the office. But if he's going to be in the office, he shouldn't come out doing angles, busting people open and promising body bags. But Punk returned, who was in... Uh, here again, I'll give each man their proper respect. CM Punk didn't grow up in the wrestling business and didn't uh, fucking start his own promotion multiple times like Jeff did. But Jeff, honestly, has never been a position as a money-drawn talent that CM Punk was. So Punk came and did bring on the roster, did bring business, did bring pay-per-view buys, did bring house show gates, did bring ratings. And they still couldn't get close to the WWE Jeff Jarrett is not going to bring the numbers in those categories that Punk did as a wrestler. Jeff Jarrett should have been brought in as a guy who, again, has dealt with every goddamn wrestler in some fashion or another. It's been in the business for the last 25 or 30 years. And whether some people don't like him or not, he knows how to fucking... He was the one, it wasn't Dixie Carter for fuck's sake. He was the one that kept all those disparate, obnoxious, egotistical, and or motivated or unmotivated personalities in TNA on the same page most of the time for quite a few years. I would not only have Jeff's input in promoting live events, which is his strong point, finding local sponsors, local tie-ins, getting people into buildings to buy tickets. But I would also have him be the one who, as a guy, again, who's been in every position in this business. Promoter, booker, matchmaker, creative team, he's done, what a wrestler, etc. There's your talent relations guy. Because at least he can talk to him as a wrestler instead of a modern entitled prick or a goddamn nobody or a never was that nobody's going to listen to. But I don't see how both all these things can happen at the same time. Or then you're setting yourself up. But now here's another wrestler that would have an office position. And I've got, I guess now the rumor that's been floating around of what his office position is is that he might help with international markets well yes he did the thing with fucking the india show ring king or whatever 
while TNA was going on. But I mean, if, you know, yeah, let's get the most experienced guy that we've got on the in the company at a variety of things, and let's send him over to Bombay. What the fuck is going on here? So yeah, new heel, promising body bags, also going to be in the office, <laughs> and in uh, obviously being used in areas where his tremendous expertise is not as needed as it is in others. What do you think, young Brian Last? Well, I killed this on Twitter, so I should probably explain a little bit about why I think the way I do. I'll talk first about on-air, just on-air stuff. You have been praising Jay Lethal as long... I was going to say as long as I know you, but I know you longer than you know Jay Lethal. For yeah. years, you've been praising Jay Lethal to me, and especially lately with him in AEW, so now he's in front of us. I've never been as big a fan as you, but I keep trying to... I trust your word on wrestling. I keep trying to see it. The stuff in the ring in this match was great. The rest of the match and the layout of the match, blame whoever you want. But the last thing this guy needs is for people to be reminded that he was in TNA. Yeah. And this was Team TNA. Him and Sanjay and Jeff Jarrett? I don't think this helps anything. This promotion from day one has had comparisons to the worst of TNA and the worst of WCW. And when fucking Jeff Jarrett shows up on that show with a fucking guitar, I'm so, that is the biggest turnoff to so many people. I don't even know if I can put it into words. If there's any image of the worst of TNA, who is the champ? Who is on top? Jeff Jarrett. The worst of WCW, who is in the middle of it? Now, wait a minute. I don't think Jeff Jarrett was the champion during the worst of TNA. Remember how long that thing lasted before Aunt Dixie slunk off. You're right. I'll get to the behind-the-scenes stuff, but I don't think it's a positive to Jay Lethal, but maybe that's a lost cause right now. I don't think it's a positive to the overall show to have Jeff Jarrett on there. That's not to take away what he could do in the ring, because I think the problem has always been He's a much, much, much more talented wrestler than he is someone that the fans invest in. I will, I will concur with that. He's an incredibly talented wrestler. However, it conjures up feelings like mine. Like, oh, it feels like the end of WCW when you see Jeff Jarrett and his fucking guitar. Behind the scenes, I agree he can help with a lot of stuff. I don't know if he's, you know, some people say he should be Tony's right-hand man or the head of creative. I'm not going to go that far. Get him in the door first. Let's see how he coexists with everyone. Well, and see, here's the thing. Jeff was it's like the Senate over there. Jeff was the head of, cre of the creative team in TNA. And of course, then you had the dynamic of Russo working against him and behind his back with Dixie and blah, blah, blah. But whether he was there or not, Jeff was always the head of creative, but he didn't sit down and do the whole thing himself. That's why he had Dutch. That's why he had other people at various points in time. And I'm not saying that Jeff should be the head of creative. I'm saying Jeff should help Tony Khan run that fucking business and keep the wrestlers from each other's throats. And that's what he's got experience in. And he's made more of an impact in starting TNA in keeping it alive all that time and starting other companies, doing promotions behind the scenes than he has in the ring. And that at this point is what AEW badly needs instead of other wrestling talent that again he may be good what are we going are we going to invest in getting jeff over on this program when he's in his 50s we got younger guys but boy they need direction people vomit they, they don't, people they don't, vomit they when they hear that music play people just get ready to vomit all over the place as soon as they hear well them. hey i get ready to vomit all over the place every time this program comes on the air well here's another problem they named him head of business development i think it was Head of business development. I've worked with real business development people. AEW, if they don't have a serious executive there who's handling business development, they're fucked. Not someone who could help with the wrestling end of thing getting sponsors. But as a company, it can't be Jeff Jarrett doing that. That's what I want to know. What exactly is his well, job? But do, but do they know what the head of business development means? And see, here's another Tony thing. Tony should. If, Tony should. Well, Tony should know a lot of things. If you get a guy in the wrestling business like that or anybody else that has experience in a variety of things and blah, 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 you don't give him a – well, you can give him any job title you want. Give it here. Here, your head fucking ball liquor. I don't give a shit. 
Go out and do the shit you do. That's what that's you know what that's what I did with Kerry Silken with Ring of Honor before, which is the reason. And by the way, they were in Baltimore, uh, and every part of the show was Ring of Honor. And I had to think that those poor people in Baltimore, some of them are like, we remember when the Ring of Honor shows were a lot better than this. But that's what you you don't just say, okay, this is your department, you do this. You bring somebody in with that variety of experience in wrestling and say, help me, do your shit. Book something, talk some fucking star into coming over here, find me a sponsor, get me a TV contract, find somebody you know to make my program better, an announcer, whatever the fuck, coach the kids, do what you do, and whatever their job title is. So I don't care what his job title is, I just think he ought to be a resource that Tony can use that better than... We'll Whacking see. people over the head with yeah. a guitar. Well, we'll see how late Jeff Jarrett could stay up on Tuesday nights with Tony if he wants to make a real impact on that show. Do you understand what I'm saying, though, about the idea that if you're yes. someone who hates TNA or someone who just remembers the fall of TNA, whatever you want to call it, it's him and Sanjay and Jay Lethal. It drags Jay Lethal down. In this, d- in this day and age, an alternative young people's wrestling promotion an alternative to the WWE and the establishment or whatever needs to have young faces and young stars with older people in experience behind the scenes and behind them leading them to be the new generation, not a clusterfuck because the limited veterans that are there are so glad to have a job or the entitled pricks that have been named their bosses are so fucking self-taught and obnoxious they can't break down and realize they don't know what they're doing at that level and a feckless fucking owner running around trying to be everybody's friend you know when vince moved pat patterson off commentary that's right around the time he dyed his hair you never saw him on tv they never said his name for years except when they were making fun of jobbers and sexual fetishes or whatever you never heard anything about pat patterson When they had those agent pull-apart brawls, it was just another dark-haired guy. I'm not saying Jeff Jarrett has to dye his hair, but he shouldn't be involved in angles right now in 2022 on TV, shouldn't be involved in matches. He should be working behind the scenes. Well, and as a matter of fact, considering the level of brain power a lot of these fucking people are involved with, um, he might be running. If the company still exists in a year and a half, he might be running it. Tony will be in rehab and oh, that's or a curse. mental institution. That's, you, just, you just cursed it. That's the same thing you said about him and WWE. Oh, watch out. Something happened to Vince and Jeff may run the whole thing. Well, yeah, and you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I think Triple H thought that too. And the first, one of the first things he did was, well, we, we need you to go home. He didn't need competition. <laughs> 